Um, welcome everyone to the Cell and Tissue Mechanics Seminar Series. This month, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Vivek Shenoy, who is the Eduardo D. Gland President's Distinguished Professor in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the University of, Min of, of Pennsylvania. Professor uh, Shenoy's research focuses on developing theoretical and numerical methods to understand the basic principles that control the behavior of biological systems. He has used rigorous analytical methods and multi-scale modeling techniques ranging from molecular to continuum methods to gain physical insight into a lot of problems in related to mechanobiology and biomaterials. He's the principal investigator in and director of the NSF funded Science and Technology Center for Engineering Mechanobiology and an MPI of the NCI funded Metastasis Research Network. Okay, so today he's going to talk about how forces transmitted from a cell environment affect DNA uh, organization. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak. The floor is yours. Yeah, th th thanks, Roberto. Uh, so today, what I want to uh, talk about is uh, some of our recent work uh, where we've looked uh, both using imaging, uh, analytical theory and simulations, how uh, the organization of uh, DNA in three-dimensional space depends on the stiffness of the microenvironment. So that's what I wanna uh, talk about. And so that's important because the way DNA is organized uh, if there is more heterochromatin, then those genes are not going to be expressed. So it's a different level uh, of uh, controlling, a different way of controlling gene expression without really uh, changing the actual uh, sequence, simply by changing the way DNA is packaged. All right. So, uh, so I want to start by, you know, the standard slide. And this is important here in that uh, different organs have different stiffness. You have something like bone that's like brick or brain that's like soft tofu uh, and so here you have uh, uh, so so tissues typically have both cells extracellular matrix and fluid so recently uh, Paul Jamni and I uh, in our groups uh, looked at what this uh, what contributes to stiffness is it the cell is it the ECM turns out that a lot of the contribution comes from collagen so bone has a lot of collagen, brain is less collagen, uh, and I have the paper cited there, uh, but the important thing is you have these cells that are uh, seeing microenvironments that are, are very different when you go from uh, one organ to the other. That's certainly important in the context of uh, cancer because you have a cell, uh, say, as they say, triple negative breast cancer cell it starts from an, uh, 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 it's an epithelial cell, which then can, invade uh, here, as you uh, see, into the extracellular matrix, you know, which may fall maybe a little bit higher in that stiffness range, then go to the blood vessel and eventually uh, go to the bone. So the same cell now is seeing all these different mechanical environments. And uh, the focus of this new U54 uh, that Roger Cam and I are leading is to really understand as the cells go through this metastatic cascade, what, how exactly is the chromosome, uh, how exactly is DNA organized in 3D space? And, uh, and can the cells go dormant, uh, right? Can they proliferate? Th those kind of uh, questions by a combination of uh, uh, in vivo, in vitro, as well as uh, uh, analytical theory, and uh, and da and uh, uh, data from sequencing RNA seq, chip seq, etc. So that that's kind of the goal. So today, what I want to talk about is some of the work uh, that we presented as preliminary data for this grant, which just started less than a year ago. And that is uh, how does uh, 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 the organization of DNA uh, within the nucleus depend on the stiffness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with uh, uh, you know talking about things most of you know, uh, which is uh, how does the nuclear morphology depend on stiffness, cell shape, etc. And so that, that's one piece of it. And a lot of that is uh, determined by 
what kind of contractile forces the cell can generate depending on the shape or the microenvironment. So a piece that's maybe less obvious is the fact that uh, contractility can also uh, sort of uh, regulate epigenetic marks through shuttling of uh, epigenetic regulators between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So we had looked at this uh, a few years ago. So I'll briefly talk about that in the, uh, you know, in the beginning, just to set the stage. And what I want to talk about primarily is this work that's going to uh, appear soon, maybe in a week or two. Uh, we do have a, a preprint on the archive. So here, what we want to look at is if you image the nucleus uh, using high resolution techniques like STOM, then we can see uh, the density of DNA within the nucleus. And these red dots that you see are uh, regions where there is heterochromatin, where the chromatin is condensed. And if you look at the organization, you see that uh, uh, you see that there are uh, you know these kind of domains in the interior of the nucleus, and also DNA is stacked up against the nuclear lamina. So that's another level of organization. So those are called lamina-associated domains. And so the question we want to ask is, what are the size of these domains? How are they distributed? Um, what's the thickness of this lamina-associated domain, and how does that depend? On, on stiffness, right? Uh, and so that, that's the main uh, question we want to address. And after that, so, uh, you know, as the cells migrate, they, of course, uh, uh, see mechanical forces such as uh, tensile forces, compressive forces, or even shear forces. Similarly, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the cancerous uh, microenvironment has got a pH that's different from normal tissue. So osmotic pressure is an important, uh, can play an important role in regulating the volume of the nucleus and hence the organization of chromatin. And then active forces that are responsible for transcription can also change this, or, uh, this organization. I'm not sure I'll get into all of this. So my focus is to do the first two and go as far as time permits. Uh, with the second part, most of which is unpublished. All right, so I want to start by looking at standard uh, uh, material. Everybody knows this is uh, from Dennis Disher's lab. Uh, if you uh, if you uh, plate, say, mesenchymal stem cell on a hydrogel that's thick versus something that's thin, you have the same ligand presentation on the surface. So basically, these cells are seeing uh, you know different stiffness of substrate. Uh, uh, everything else being the same. Then what ends up happening is that these cells are much more spread. They are elongated. You can see these uh, actin stress fibers here. And also the important point is that the nucleus is also quite a bit uh, deformed. So, uh, so one way of recapitulating this effect of stiffness. So here, as you see, the cells are, uh, are quite a bit elongated. So you can take a glass substrate and put the cells you can uh, sort of control the cell shape by uh, by appropriately designing a fibronectin patch. And here, uh, the stiff and soft phenotypes are simply recapitulated by looking by changing the cell shape. If the cell is elongated, then you have these adhesions at these ends. You have the stress fibers that go over and uh, you know push the nucleus down. And so the nucleus is more like a pancake. But as if it's round, uh, as in the soft case, then the cells are, uh, 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 the nucleus is more round. I'll, I'll come, uh, I'll show you better images in a second. So now the question we want to ask is, how does this affect uh, organization of chromatin? So for this talk, uh, as far as uh, chromatin involves uh, the double helix, as well as a whole bunch of other proteins, as far as we are concerned, there are only two concepts uh, that are important. The first is that Broadly speaking, uh, at least for the kind of imaging we are going to do, we can distinguish uh, hetero and euchromatin. And so it's a very old image uh, from a molecular biology uh, textbook that shows these dark regions, more condensed uh, chromatin called heterochromatin, and these light regions uh, are, are euchromatin. And if you think about it from the point of view of how DNA is packaged, you know that this double helix is uh, wound on histones. And uh, and depending on whether these histones here on the top or the bottom are decorated with methyl groups or acetyl groups, the uh, uh, you know the DNA is closely packed or or, or it's loosely packed. So closely packed uh, DNA is heterochromatin, uh, loosely packed is euchromatin. So here uh, this segment is now accessible uh, to the transcriptional machinery. So this gene here uh, can be expressed. 
And the reason this happens is because of the interactions, uh, charge interactions, etc., which I won't go into. So the important fact is that naturally there are these uh, two states. And now what's important is you can sort of convert euchromatin to heterochromatin by changing the level of acetylation or methylation. So if you acetylate a methyl group, uh, this thing, uh, you know, your heterochromatin is going to become euchromatin and methylation will do the opposite. And these are regulated by epigenetic regulators such as histone deacetylase. So that's going to be an important uh, piece uh, here. And so histone uh, deacetylase can sort of, uh, uh, you know, take the acetyl group and promote uh, methylation. And in fact, this is going to be controlled by, uh, by contractility. So that's really where the contractility uh, comes in, just looking ahead. All right, great. Uh, now we know uh, why this is important. The reason this is important is every cell in our body has exactly the same DNA. If you look at our, your hands, then in the bone, you have osteocytes, osteoclasts. In the skin, there are fibroblasts, fat cells, those are for the nerves. And all these cells have exactly the same DNA, but they do, uh, they carry out different functions. In other words, they're expressing different genes. So the way you do that is, uh, you know, by uh, having some of your uh, DNA in the euchromatic state, uh, say for instance, uh, uh, for, for a proper functioning of the nerve, this gene is required, whereas this is required for the functioning of the fibroblast. So that's in the heterochromatic states, so that's in the euchromatic state. So if you want to look at an analog of that, I made this in winter. So it's a, you know, so if you, uh, it, with your thread, you can either knit a, a scarf or a cap. So the way you've changed uh, three-dimensional organization and you get uh, something completely different. And so now DNA organization is also different in disease cells. And also, you know, this epigenetics depends on everything else, everything that's not your, uh, you know, your uh, sequence. So clearly it depends on lifestyle and, uh, uh, you know, things of that nature. All right. So here, let's, uh, with this idea, let's see what happens when you look at the cells uh, that are on the elongated uh, uh, substrate and or on the circular one. So here you see that there is more histone deacetylase uh, in the nucleus. Again, better images uh, are, 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 are forthcoming. Uh, so, and, and the important point here is that it's a lot more condensation here. So, uh, so the cells on soft substrates are more transcriptionally inactive compared to the cells on, on stiff. And up to 400 genes can be expressed differently between these two cases. So the question that what we want to address is, is why, okay? So, so to do that, first, we got to look at uh, how the microenvironment is affecting the adhesions, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the contractile missionary, et cetera. And from there, we will go on to talk about uh, epigenetics. So the first part I want to talk about is cellular nuclear mechanosensing. It's already a published work, so I'm going to be uh, very brief with it. And they're all familiar concepts. So in response to forces that the cells sense, uh, the, 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 the level of contractility can be regulated through row signaling or through uh, calcium signaling, depending on time scale. These are fast, these are a bit slower. Uh, and, uh, and so the bottom line here is that we want to describe contractility within the cell. So how do we do that? So what we do is we sort of think of myosin as force dipoles, and then you can write a density of force dipoles, right? Because uh, myosin is basically doing this. So, uh, you know, so there is a force and a distance, right? So that, that's what gives you the dipole. And these are distributed, uh, you know, uh, in arbitrary orientations throughout the cell. And what we want to figure out is spatiotemporally predict what this uh, contract lady is. So the main idea being here, uh, here that uh, in the absence of any forces that are sensed from the microenvironment, the contractility is isotropic or uh, you know, it doesn't have any, uh, any, any deviatoric or it, it, things that deviate from the isotropic state. And uh, in response to the mechanical stresses, uh, your contractility can increase. Meaning if you pull in some direction, as you're gonna see in a second, the fibers are gonna form in that direction. So this anisotropy is already built into sort of our formulation. And these feedback coefficients here, alpha, et cetera, have to do with signaling. So it's a kind of a coarse-grained approach uh, where, uh, where, where these quantities uh, represent the signaling. So we've actually done, a, uh, you know, um, used this model for a number of, uh, uh, studying a number of different phenomena that I've uh, listed here, if you're interested. 
But here, what I want to do is just uh, uh, look at this problem at hand where, uh, you know, we start with the cell uh, where the nucleus is uh, spherical, one is elongated, the other is, uh, uh, the, the other is more of a square. And as the cell, uh, you know, initially the contractility is isotropic. So as the cell pulls, what's going to happen is that in the, uh, uh, in the elongated case, your stress becomes anisotropic. Why? Because of the shape. And that anisotropy feeds back. And what you end up getting here are oriented stress fibers. Here there are, they are more, uh, much more isotropic. And as these stress fibers uh, generate forces, they can squeeze the nucleus down. So very nicely, we can sort of match uh, uh, sort of uh, the nuclear shapes, the orientation of stress fibers, et cetera, uh, in a lot of detail. All right, great. So what has this got to do with, the, uh, with organization of chromatin? So as you, uh, you know, as uh, G-actin sort of, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, polymerizes to form F-actin, there are a couple of things that can happen. So there are these uh, transcription factors like MKL that have substrates uh, on G-actin. So now the thermodynamics is sort of uh, uh, disturbed as, as this, uh, you know, as you can form F-actin because of that feedback I described. So, so as these G-actin uh, uh, monomers polymerize to form F-actin, your MKL can go into the, uh, into the nucleus. And of course, then it can transcribe and further stabilize it. So that's, that's one process where things, uh, epi, uh, you know, transcription factors can shuttle from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. Now, on the other hand, if they have substrates on F-actin, then they can sort of uh, uh, do the opposite, go from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. In fact, histone deacetylase is uh, one such example. And now, uh, so you, let, let, let's say we are looking at the histone, histone deacetylase, then there is the nucleus to cytoplasmic shuttling. And of course, cytoplasmic to the nucleus is the opposite, but this depends on contractility. So what we can do is we have contractility in space. So uh, there's, there's a diffusion term too, which I've ignored, but, uh, but bottom line is you can write these equations and uh, then, these kinetic parameters, for instance, you can uh, you can uh, fit by say looking at three different shapes in blue, and then other shapes, other area, and things like that uh, become a prediction. So we are able to predict this uh, very, very very nicely. Now, uh, so that that's one test. Uh, a second test is that as you're uh, you know as you're sitting down on your chair, if you're standing, uh, not a problem. If you're sitting down, then the forces. Uh, you know, there are the connective cells in your body are subject to around two micronewtons of force. So our, so our thinking then was if you go in here and take the cell that's sitting uh, on, uh, you know, on this pattern and then squeeze it down, then what, see, uh, uh, so it's the tension that's sort of driving this feedback, right? It's the tension uh, that, 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 that's causing the formation of these actomyosin fibers. So when, when they in this compression, they sort of, uh, 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 you know, come apart. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, this is work with Shiv Shankar, uh, uh, published, uh, you know, in these two articles, uh, where uh, you can see that as you, uh, you know, as you squeeze, uh, uh, as you push the cell down, your, uh, uh, you know, your actomyosin cables come apart. And but uh, more importantly, the histone uh, deacetylases now are in the nucleus here, here, there in the cytoplasm, and as you can see, the DNA is more condensed uh, here. All right, so this sort of gives a mechanism, but how exactly is it organized is what, what, what the next part is going to be. So here, uh, this is a work that's done in close uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Malike Lakadami Ali, uh, who's a high resolution uh, uh, imaging expert in the Department of Physiology and Rob Mock and Su Chin Ho from orthopedic surgery. Uh, and so here, what we did is, uh, we took mesenchymal uh, stem cells and plated them on uh, the usual thing we do in mechanobiology on stiff, soft, and on glass, and imaged, uh, uh, the, imaged the organization of DNA with high resolution. And what you're seeing here, the red regions are regions of uh, histone H2B. So the Dark regions here sort of uh, re re represent heterochromatin, and the you know the uh, the more greener or dark regions less DNA. You see that uh, there's a big difference in the way uh, you know in the way chromatin is organized. Uh, in on soft substrate compared to stiff, 
uh, the interior domains are sparse and they're of larger sizes. Usually the sizes are bigger. And more importantly, a lot of the chromatin is stacked up against the nuclear lamina uh, in this case compared to this case. So what we want to understand is why that is, what the sizes are, what the sizes of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, 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 this lamina associated domains are and what leads to this sort of a partitioning as a function of stiffness. All right, so that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Now in ongoing work, we are actually sequencing these cells as well. Uh, we are doing RNA-seq and, uh, uh, and ATAC-seq and things like that. And uh, down the road, our goal is to maybe even predict which genes may be expressed uh, uh, you know, based on, uh, if, if you know the organization in one case, uh, uh, can, can we predict the organization in the other? So that, that, that's a question we are sort of headed to answering. All right, so now, uh, so what we want to now do is, uh, you know, we know that sub substrate stiffness changes actomycin contractility, that changes the shuttling of epigenetic factors. And uh, once you have HDAC3, what that can do is uh, it can have more, uh, you know, it can take your acetylated uh, 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 DNA and, and uh, histones and make them methylated. So there's more condensation. And so what we want to study, uh, let's predict the sizes, uh, you know, the thickness of your lamin associated domains, et cetera, uh, by considering these processes. And for that, we're going to do a, a, since the imaging is not really looking at sequences, it's only giving a density. So to model this sort of an, a, a system uh, where uh, the images, uh, you know, only are sort of uh, giving you hetero versus you, our model also is similar. So what we are going to say is that at any point in space, you can have three components. So the heterochromatic domain, the euchromatic domain, the, the remaining is water, right? And the Cs here, H for heterochromatin, E for euchromatin, W for water, uh, you know, that, those are volume fractions. So they should all add up to one. So while there are three variables, uh, right? There are only two independent uh, uh, variables. Okay, great. So now what we want to do is, uh, uh, you know, why, why is, uh, you know, why is there condensation? Uh, you know, why is there hetero versus U? That's because of chromatin chromatin uh, interactions, uh, you know, which are facilitated facilitated by these methyl uh, groups and acetyl groups. So we will include chromatin uh, chromatin interactions and also chromatin lamina interactions. They are important for uh, understanding the formation of lamina associated uh, domains. Now, uh, the other key ingredient, which sort of makes this uh, highly non-equilibrium system and uh, a lot of the sort of the thermodynamic ideas, they kind of break down, is when you consider this kinetics of uh, methylation acetylation. So, uh, so these are, uh, you know, sort of enzymatic reactions, ATPase is maybe involved. Uh, and so here, what we are Thinking about a sort of conversion of uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of heterochromatin into euchromatin through these reactions. So I'll show the details in a second. So let's start with the more uh, the energetic uh, pieces. So so there are three variables, uh, but there are two independent variables. So one variable to deal with uh, is actually the amount of water, right? The amount of water and uh, you know the amount of uh, DNA will add up to one. So hetero plus U is DNA. And so we assume that anything that's not DNA is, is put, sort of put in this nucleoplasm. So that's one variable. And that's, uh, that's important because you squeeze in the nucleus and things, water goes out. So that's a way of controlling it. Forces can control uh, uh, this. Uh, the other is the sort of the order parameter, if you will, which is the difference between heterochromatin and euchromatin. So these are the two variables uh, you know, we're going to be uh, using. And, uh, and what we want to do is if you start from certain density, how does that evolve? What are the driving forces that lead to this evolution? So that's a question we want to address. So as I said, we'll start with the energy. So for that, uh, you know, you have some basic energy landscape that sort of gives you, uh, you know, sort of the U and heterochromatic phase. So that's in here. I'll show it to you in a second. Then there are interfaces. Every time you form hetero and you, there are interfaces. The important point is these interfacial energies are going to turn out to be not important. You can even set them to zero and everything that I'm going to say is going to work. They can't be too big, right? I, I'll come to that. Uh, and also there is elasticity uh, and I'm going to skip that for the time being uh, because uh, you know that's the second part of the talk, all right? Uh, even without bringing in elasticity, you can explain a lot of these things. Elasticity makes it more concrete. 
All right. So, uh, so this here is your energy landscape that sort of gives you the, uh, the two phases. Uh, so, uh, as I said, there are two variables. One is the amount of water and the other is, uh, you know, the difference between hetero and euchromatin. So, if you're here, you're 100% heterochromatin. If you're on the other side, you're euchromatin. Here, there's a lot of water. So, you see that the landscape, energy landscape, uh, we have chosen, uh, right, uh, you know, based on these physics of interactions is that you have uh, you have two minima. So these blue minima uh, uh, correspond to, uh, you know, here there's a lot of water and this number is sort of negative. That means it's more euchromatic. This is a more heterochromatic phase because there's less amount of water. This, uh, you know, the order parameter is close to one. So, uh, you know, so that's it. So these are the two phases uh, you're gonna consider, right? Now in a typical cell, uh, you know, there's roughly 50% water. So you're somewhere here, right? So you wanna phase separate. Okay, and uh, similarly, uh, right? I mean, there's roughly you know same amount of U and hetero, so you are kind of in this unstable uh, uh, region here. So you want to phase separate. So what we want to understand is what's the dynamics of this phase separation, right? I'm not sure. I have through imaging we can actually look at the dynamics. Maybe I'll have time at the very end if you have questions and such to look at that. But it's going to be mostly static. But you know, but static is important because you start off from some random state. The question is, what are the stable states? steady states, where, where, where does it go and end up? So to look at that, you really need to know the dynamics that correspond to water and uh, you know the dynamics of uh, hetero and euchromatin. So, uh, uh, so clearly, uh, you know, so uh, the, the euchromatic state is an open state. The heterochromatic state is condensed. So if you want to convert U to hetero, you love to move water, right? You got to move water from one place to the other. So we consider water diffusion without going into too many details. Now the order parameter or the difference between hetero and mu are both driven by energy as well as the acetylation and methylation rates. So acetylation can convert uh, uh, you know, methylated states to uh, euchromatin and methylation can do the opposite. So we consider these reactions. So if you look at the difference, the difference will go up because of methylation, right? Because uh, positive is methylation. And then you also have this sort of uh, energetic driving force, right? Because you know that the uh, sort of the red likes red, blue likes blue. So there's gonna be the standard diffusion sort of phenomena also occurring uh, here. So that's also percent. So nothing, uh, nothing really out of the ordinary. What's really uh, key here is this term that I've added here. And that's gonna uh, you know, determine the physics, including the size of these domains, uh, the effect of uh, mechan uh, of stiffness, et cetera, in a big way. The other terms are pretty standard. All right, so now what we wanna do is I just wanna give an example where I just wanna show you standard stuff. If I didn't keep this, what would have happened? So if I didn't have that, uh, right, uh, you know, as I said, you're roughly in the middle here, this is unstable. And if I start with this color here, which is neither red nor blue, it wants to phase separate to red and blue. And the way it's gonna do that is it's gonna go unstable first, it's called spinodal decomposition. And then as uh, you know, if, if there are interfaces present, right? It's gonna coarsen and give you a big structure like this. If the interface energy is not zero, it won't pick a length scale. You may get uh, you know, a, a distribution, but, uh, but when interface energy is zero, uh, you know, uh, it's finite. You're gonna eventually coarsen and you're gonna get something like this. Now, what I'm gonna show you is that in our case, there's a length scale that emerges, a clear length scale that emerges. And that has to do with the kinetics, right? That's, that's what I wanna uh, show. All right, great. So this is sort of the straw man, right? Uh, 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 the standard energy uh, will uh, sort of lead to coarsening even with a small, uh, 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 small interface energy. All right, great. Now let's see what will ha what happens when you, uh, you know, when you include methylation and acetylation. So this really is the evolution equation. In steady state, right? This, uh, you know, you don't have this variation. And if you integrate over the whole nucleus, then this is sort of a volume term, right? If, uh, if the, you know, in steady state, if there are no, uh, you know, DNA is really not crossing the, you know, the boundary. So that flux will be zero. So then you get a very important relation that the net amount of heterochromatin, the fraction, is decided by the you know the ratio of the methylation rate to the total rate. This makes total sense. High amount of methylation, you'll get more heterochromatin. Low methylation, you get less heterochromatin. So so it's just the balance of these reactions that gives you this. 
and the and amount of water. That's important too, uh, because the new, volume of the nucleus can be controlled by applying forces, and that changes water. So, so that, 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 that that's an important aspect too. So now what happens is that actually falls here, right? This uh, you know this particular uh, 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 you know level of uh, uh, let's say the water content you fixed here, and then uh, you know the acetylation and methylation say pick this. So clearly this is not in the you know in, in this well or this well, right? But remember this well is not stable from the perspective of reactions. Because those reactions will sort of push it back here. So there's a tug of war here between the energetics that actually want you to go to these minima and the reactions that you uh, that want you to go here. So how how does the system sort of pick the sort of optimum configuration? So I'm going to explain that in a second. But the way it does that is by forming these periodic patterns, and that clearly depends on the level of methylation. If the level of methylation is small, then the amount of uh, heterochromatin is small. And again, we started off with a completely random configuration. And this went and self-organized into this sort of a pattern. Whereas here, uh, you know, you get more complex uh, patterns if there is more heterochromatin. So the organization uh, you know, becomes more crowded and even more glassy somewhere in this regime, because there are many ways you can arrange this. And this Glassiness, I'm not sure I'll have time to talk about it, plays a role, right? Uh, it can give you hysteresis, memory, etc. All right. So now, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's do the simple things first. Uh, so the question is, can we understand what gives rise to this scale, right? What gives rise to this length scale? There's a clear length scale and spacing. So can we predict that? That's sort of the next question. So as I said, the steady state sort of puts you here, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, puts you over here. But you do want to go here and here. So what can happen? So, so what you can do is, so this is closer to euchromatin. So what you can do is you can nucleate a phase of, uh, of heterochromatin, which I'm, uh, which I'm showing in red, right? And then, and then uh, so what's going to happen? Again, total DNA has to be conserved. So some of that DNA is going to go into this phase. Uh, so here you have a certain amount of DNA. And so now you ought to have a looser phase. So in between, what you're going to do is you're going to go here. So somehow you're going to conserve the amount of DNA. And what decides that is really the fact that uh, you know here there is a gradient, uh, you know, in your uh, in your order parameter. So there's going to be diffusion. This in and of itself is unstable. So uh, so there's going to be the opposite flux here. So these diffusive flux and these flux due to the fact that. This itself wants to, uh, you know, these reactions want to convert it to uh, a different state. They balance. That's what actually is going to give you the size, right? So I kind of said this in words, but this can be made very precise. So if you did not have reactions, right? Whenever you nucleate a phase like this, there is a driving force, uh, you know, here that I've written, which, uh, which sort of, which is driven by the double well, which wants it to grow. The red phase is energetically lower, so it actually wants to grow. But the interfacial energy does not want it to grow because the larger it grows, interfacial energy will blow up. So if you now look at the growth rate of one of these domains, what you will see is that there is a, you know, below a critical radius, this will shrink and above it will grow, just depending on the landscape, right? How much energy you gain. You know, that has been normalized to one here, but, but that, that, that's really the idea. So uh, and this is standard, you know, this is material science or physics 101, where you see that uh, everything above a certain size will grow, below will decay. And, and if that happens, the chemical potential will evolve and eventually you'll get one shape here, right? Whereas if you now bring in the reactions, what you see is that, uh, you know, this state is unstable. So, so at very large sizes, right, it, 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 it'll come apart. So the point is this, curve, which, which was positive here, will veer and give you a stable radius. So, uh, so about this point, if you uh, shrink this a little bit, it'll grow. If you grow this a little bit, it'll shrink. So this clearly gives you a length scale, right? And what does this length scale depend uh, will, uh, What does it depend on? It does not depend on the interfacial energy, because that's dominant here. It's sort of competition between this term here and this here. So if you work it out, turns out that you will get a size and uh, you know, and the size is a basic uh, is basically square root of the diffusion to one of the reaction rates. How do we see that diffusion? It's like uh, you know meter square per second, right? Reaction is one over second. So when you divide the two, you get meter square. Take a square root. That's what the length is. So it's a hundred percent kinetic uh, decided by kinetics. 
And clearly, uh, you know, it depends on the methylation rate, the acetylation uh, rate. And now if we compare with experiment, we know that on, uh, on stiffer substrates, uh, right, uh, uh, you know, the activity of HDAC is different, uh, uh, right? The HDAC is gonna go uh, into the cytoplasm. So you will get, uh, uh, you know, so you will get smaller domains. Here you will get uh, bigger domains, right? And, and, uh, and that, that comes out nicely, we can compare uh, with, the, with the data. Now what's missing here is the fact that, uh, you know, again, these are all periodic boundary conditions. I didn't really worry about the boundary, which is what I wanna do next. Uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, yeah uh, that, that's probably the last thing uh, you know we need to consider to sort of tie all these things together. So uh, you know, so uh, so chromatin has attractive uh, interactions uh, with the nuclear lamina. There are a number of uh, molecules involved, including HDAC itself. There's lap two beta, etc. Without going into the details, what we assume is that a segment of DNA has an attractive interaction with the nuclear lamina. It's exactly like the wetting phenomena, where uh, you know you can form a drop of uh, you can form water vapor on glass, like on a chilly day uh, or ice, uh, for that matter. So the important point is a molecule of water, uh, you know, will interact uh, has you know, a certain uh, attractive interaction with glass. But what glass prefers is a denser phase because there are more number of molecule per unit volume in the denser phase. By that, for that same, by that token, if you simply say that the total affinity is proportional to the density of DNA, the heterochromatic phase is going to be attracted. Reason being that uh, there's higher density there. Now with this, right, if we now uh, uh, keep the methylation level the same and increase the affinity to the nuclear lamina, we assume to have some uh, uh, characteristic scale here. What you see is that if it is, uh, if the affinity is small, then you get a sort of a non-wetting domain or something like mercury, right? Because mercury likes mercury, it's not gonna spread. That's exactly, it just ball up. If you increase the affinity, what's gonna happen is that this is gonna spread and eventually you're gonna get a completely wetted surface. Okay, so the surface, it's gonna completely wet the surface. So that's great. So clearly by changing the uh, affinity, we can sort of, uh, you know, go from non-wetting to wetting. Uh, but what about changing the methylation and acetylation levels? Here I've picked it to be something. What if I change it? How is this story gonna change? We know how things are gonna change here. If you increase methylation, these sizes are going to increase. What about these thicknesses? That, 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 that's sort of the next question, right? Uh, you know, uh, okay. So, so now there are two types of domains here: the non-wetting domains, or the you know, or, or partially wetting domains, and the fully wetted domains. So, so the result here, which can be proved both analytically and numerically, uh, and you can also come up with scaling relations, etc., which I'm not going into, is that if you have a non-wetting domain with some uh, with some wetting angle, if you increase methylation, all that will happen is that that wetting angle is going to be preserved but you're gonna change the size of these domains. That's what's gonna happen. And if you look at uh, domains that are fully vetted, then what's gonna happen is that you're gonna increase the thickness of those domains, uh, right? Uh, that, that's what's gonna happen. So it's then clear that in the soft case, you have uh, you know some of these bigger domains that are a little bit sparser uh, on, on stiffer, you have smaller, they're more close. And you have less, uh, uh, you, know, you don't have anything on the, on the boundary. So, so it clearly sort of explains uh, this data, uh, right? We use the same level of uh, affinity in the two cases, uh, you know, which may or may not be right. But the important point here is that uh, uh, the, uh, the methylation levels are certainly different. And if the methylation levels are different, that certainly is gonna change uh, the, you know, the, the size of these domains. So how do we test this? For that, you can use these epigenetic regulators, uh, right? Uh, uh, things like uh, uh, you know TSA or GSK, uh, right? Which opens up, uh, which opens up uh, heterochromatin uh, and makes it more transcriptionally active. So without changing the stiffness, if you now go on soft and treat it to GSK, you see that uh, you know the domain sizes become smaller your, uh, uh, you know, your lamin associated uh, domains uh, can kind of disappear, right? So, uh, uh, so, so, uh, so, so we can really recapitulate this simply by changing, uh, you know, the level of uh, methylation uh, 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 by uh, using GSK or TSA. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of this, uh, you know, since we have a lot of data here, you can sort of use machine learning, et cetera, and extract 
all of these material, all, all of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 mechanochemical parameters, this sort of affinity to the lamina, uh, 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 the, uh, the, you know, the energy bills, et cetera. So uh, there are questions I can address it later. So, uh, so the last thing I wanna talk about uh, here is that, uh, uh, you know, now, <coughs> Uh, to actually test this in uh, uh, in cells, uh, so our U54 is going to do these similar things uh, on cancer cells at different state of the metastatic cascade. Uh, but here, since we're working with uh, Rob Monk and Suchin, who are from orthopedic surgery, so what we did is uh, we took tenocytes, right, and tenocytes... Uh, uh, it can, uh, 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 right, I mean, uh, tenocytes are found in the tendon, and tendinosis is a, a common ailment uh, that's associated with overuse. So, uh, so here, uh, what, uh, what Rob and Suchin did is they took uh, cells from young donors, right? Uh, uh, these are a, a patient sample from young donors, from a patients with tendinosis and AIDS donors and did the same thing, right? I mean, just image. And as you can clearly see, uh, right, in patients with tendinosis, there is more lamin, uh, you know, there's more nuclear lamina, uh, right? Uh, and young, I mean, that's not the case. Uh, and so, so to see if, if stiffness alone can recapitulate this, uh, then uh, what they uh, did then was to, is not moving forward. Okay. So uh, they took the uh, cells from the young patients and plated it on glass substrates, stiff substrates, and soft substrates. Now, again, it, it's this cell that's plated on three different substrates. And you see that uh, it sort of more or less recapitulates what you see here. The one on soft looks like the, uh, you know, the case with the tendinosis because ten in, in, in tendinosis, you have degradation of the e extracellular uh, matrix. So it's sort of, uh, uh, so, so the cell is seeing something softer, as I mentioned earlier, sort of collagen decides the sort of stiffness that the uh, cell is gonna see. If there is less collagen, it's gonna see something softer. Uh, 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 you know, stiff uh, looks like young and glass looks like aged because, uh, you, know, they can, uh, you know, aged microenvironments can be fibrotic. So that's sort of roughly at least recapitulate. This certainly does it uh, in, in the case of, uh, of tendinosis. All right, so I mean, I see that I only have uh, 15 minutes and uh, certainly I wanna take questions. So I'm just gonna show you uh, one more set of data on dynamics, then I'll stop and take questions. Uh, so we can also look at how this sort of reorganization takes place uh, in, uh, you know, in real time. So for that, uh, you know, Jason Burdick, who's now in Colorado, he has these uh, stiffening gels where by shining light, you can go from three kilopascal uh, to 30 kilopascal very quickly in a matter of minutes. And now what we can do is we can plate cells on these substrates and look at how, uh, you know, 3D organization. So you see that within about two hours, there are change in condensation levels. Remember, you're going from stiff to soft. Uh, right, so the condensation has to decrease, and you can clearly see some of these domains are decreasing in size. The lat thickness is decreasing, so that happens, uh, you know, uh, to our time scale. And then on much larger time scales, there is a large scale reorganization. So I'm just going to show you one movie, and I'll stop uh, after that. So here, uh, so the way uh, that we approach this is, let's say this is a condensed phase, and you know, you change uh, the acetylation level. So you see that initially there is, uh, you know, fast time scales, there's decondensation. Then, you know, through the diffusion fields, uh, right, these things sort of interact. And, uh, you know, and then there is a lot of rearrangement, right? There's a, uh, there's a lot of rearrangement uh, going on here. And eventually it ends up, again, it can further evolve. And so the point here is that there is evolution on time scales that are much bigger than the reaction or diffusion time scales. And that really has to do with the, uh, the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, when you're given a configuration like this, there are many ways you can organize this and there's a lot of glassiness. So system can get stuck in a certain state, it can move. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take more questions if there are any on that. So with that, uh, what I've shown you is uh, 
primarily the fact that the cytoskeletal uh, you know forces uh, and epigenetic regulation can change the way dna is organized i, I didn't talk about osmotic forces uh, we've been analyzing uh, some very nice data from jerome on this and we also have collaborators who have been sort of pushing squeezing the nucleus and uh, applying mechanical forces shear tension compression etc and how that changes the amount of hetero versus euchromatin as well as by turning active forces on or off, uh, right? Uh, so transcription is an important part also in sort of this organization. Going forward, uh, our goal is to integrate sort of, uh, you know, uh, tools such as high c Chipseek, et cetera, to actually identify which segments of the DNA are in the heterochromatic and which are in the euchromatic state. So we've already started work along those lines. So these are some polymer models that actually show you this organization when you change uh, methylation levels. When the methylation levels are large, you see more red here. Uh, here you see more blue, right? And here, what you're looking at is, uh, you know, if you change uh, sort of exactly the stiffness as I described earlier, you can see these things grow here. So this is work in progress. Happy to talk about it uh, more if there are questions. So with that, uh, you know, I want to thank the folks who were involved in this work. Uh, Zingyu Chen, uh, you know, who's graduated and is now at uh, TikTok, uh, you know, and he's a machine learning engineer at TikTok. Uh, Ayush Kant, who's a postdoc. Uh, uh, Rizan, uh, who's a first year graduate student, and Vinay, who started to work on uh, polymer models. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you, beautiful. Questions for Vivek? I can start with one. Um, I don't know if you are aware about the uh, work by Alexandra Sidovska in chromatin organization. Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, yeah, I've been in touch with her, yeah. Sure, yes, sure. so they they talk about this ATP dependent active intranuclear forces. Uh, can you comment on oh, yeah, yeah. the role in, uh, in chromatin organization? I mean, am I sharing the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, so- uh, oh, No, no, you are not sharing, sorry. No, I'm you're... not, okay, yeah. yeah. You know, a ATP is involved at different levels, right? I mean, it's involved at many, many different levels. Mm -hmm. One place where it is involved is actually, uh, you know, during, uh, you know, so uh, during transcription, right? Uh, RNA polymerase binds on DNA and sort of ATP is involved there. And that can actually lead to supercoiling of DNA. And that sort of facilitate these CTCF loops uh, to sort of uh, move towards this boundary. And so bottom line, right? Uh, so all of this is active. So Sigma A is active. So this is a new reaction term that we have added to include the effect of ATP uh, due to transcription. So if I understand what a lot of what, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Alexandra, right? What she talks about is it's all sort of the ATP sort of changing, um, you know, this uh, hetero U balance. That's exactly what we've done here. And it actually occurs on the boundaries. So with that, what you can now see is, uh, uh, again, we've been working with uh, Maliki Academy Ali and Pia Cosma, who's at the Center for Genome Research in Barcelona. So with ACT-D, if you sort of uh, get rid of transcription, then you don't have a lot of this pooling that actually changes, that makes these domains bigger, right? And you can look at this at the genome level. It also changes the lab thickness. All of this we can sort of recapitulate. So I didn't talk about it. Uh, I only talked about the, uh, so a, a, there may be ATP involved in other places too, which you can put in, but this is one place where at least the data we have seen, uh, seem to suggest that it's important, uh, right? And so uh, Ayush, who's I think on this call has a preprint model as ready on this, uh, right? So, so th this is one place where ATP will go. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yes, please go ahead, Wong. Thank you, Vivek. So this is a beautiful presentation. Uh, Thanks. I'm so, you know, stimulated. Uh, so one question would be, it's apparent that the mechanical environment can affect the chromatin state change. Right. And uh, I don't know whether you also look into the specific genes associated with the 
you know, chromatin states? Uh, that's the first question. And the second, whether those change are dependent on like a specific cell type, you know, whether if you switch to a different cell type, the pipette will be seeing a different kind of response. Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. So, uh, right, so, I, you know, I went through it rather quickly and we don't have the results. But the answer to the first question is that is exactly what we are working on. So let me just show you some slides. Uh, you know, so, let's see. Right, so, uh, uh, so it, th there are these uh, techniques called high C, uh, you know, mm -hmm. techniques. And so what, what you can do is you can go through sort of, uh, you know, your uh, whole sequence, your DNA, and put these into A and B compartments, right? A, A, me, uh, A, A is euchromatin, B is heterochromatin. So, and this is cell type dependent, right? So let's say, let's say you're on glass, right? You sequence the cell, uh, you do high C, you do RNA seq, et cetera. And using uh, sort of machine learning tools, et cetera, uh, you know, you can uh, look at a lot of different epigenetic marks and transcription factors, et cetera, and put this into A and B, right? And then what we have done is we've actually created a sort of a polymer model for this, where A attracts B, B attracts uh, B, and AB attractions are weak. And another level of organization is the formation of these CTCF loops, which again, you can get from sequencing data, right? You can look at CTCF, Gypsy and get that. And with this, right, we can, and so these are these polymer models, right? So you know, some things are in euchromatic state, some are in heterochromatic state, it's a work in progress. So, so each of these beads here correspond to a gene. So we exactly know which gene is sitting where, right? And here, what we have done is we've just changed the methylation level uh, from here to here, and you can see this grow. So you can see that some of the red is becoming blue. So we know which bead is becoming green, uh, sorry, blue. So you know which gene is changing clearly. So we are kind of going in the direction that you suggested in, in your first question. Second question, clearly it, is, it should be cell type dependent, right? But our hope is that cells like mesenchymal stem cells or uh, or fibroblasts or uh, you, you know maybe more uh, you know more uh, uh, mesenchymal type of uh, cells in even smooth muscle cells for that matter some of these genes may be the same right they, they may be the genes that really reinforce adhesions uh, right uh, they, they may be the genes that are really required for contractility etc uh, on stiff and and so we have not, we don't have any results of yet, as of yet. We are still working on this. So this is really the direction we are headed. So great question. And that's <laughs> hopefully in the next year, there may be some progress. Very cool stuff. Thank you. I have one more question. What, yeah. What's, what's the role of hydrodynamics? Like, does the viscosity enter in your model or... Uh, you know, the water flow, uh, right, there is a diffusion constant there. So viscosity can be put in put in there, uh, right? I mean, so this water flow, we are considering water flow. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, and, and uh, you know, since you asked, uh, and I have more data, so I can, uh, so depending on whether or not, uh, whether or not, uh, uh, you know, the rate at which you're deforming the nucleus, that will have an effect on stiffness and on chromatin organization i had a slide here which i couldn't so uh you know let, 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 let's say you have the nucleus and you're uh, pulling this fast and slow right uh and so as your uh, so water has to flow in and out so depending on how you're doing this uh right uh, your uh, uh, your effective stiffness and the amount of u and hetero all of that will change so compressive loads will give more uh, heterochromatin, uh, uh, you know, you pull it, more water will come in, you'll get more. Uh, and that sort of that effective uh, uh, poroelastic parameter there that sort of governs diffusion, that sort of uh, will decide, uh, right? How much of it is happening and things like that. So, so there's a lot to be explored here. Uh, in other words, all of the time dependent effects have to do with those kind of dissipative terms. Juliano, good to see you. Hey, hi, Vec. Nice to see you. Thank you for yeah. the great talk. Uh, so I wonder what's your opinion of what will happen when topographic cues change? So I keep the same stiffness, but the cell is in 2D versus 3D or going on a track or something like that. 
Yeah, so Topa, I mean, uh, at least uh, so two, two, uh, two things can happen. So the contractility is going to be different. Because the contractility is going to be different, your epigenetic regulators will be different. And then, the you know, I didn't really go into it, but we can also look at the impact of sort of the stress fibers pushing down on the nucleus. Actually, that effect is actually a little bit smaller uh, than the, and so that was quick. So the whole nuclear shape, volume, et cetera, is going to be controlled. That's going to change how this is organized, can be analyzed within this sort of an approach. And on uh, and on top of that, uh, the contractility will decide how much uh, HDAC or uh, easy H2 and things like that are percent. So, so that, 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 that's the other angle. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker once again. And next month we will hear from Professor Jan Lammerding. Uh, see you next month and take care. Bye bye. Great.